Hello, and you're very welcome to the second session in today's day-long literary and storytelling festival. This session is entitled Author's Journey from Idea to Publication. And we're delighted to have with us a number of fellows today who will be talking about their experiences and the nascent idea of perhaps publishing a story and the challenges and successes and perhaps obstacles along the way until they achieve their goal of publishing. We're looking forward to hearing each of the fellows read an excerpt from their book. So let's get underway with an author who I've had the pleasure of knowing for some time now, an Atlantic Fellow for Social Equity. That programme is based in Melbourne, and Dirk Hani Ayubi is one of the fellows there. She's based in Adelaide in Australia, and I'd like to hear from Dirk Hani if she wouldn't mind reading an excerpt from her book. Just to give you a little flavour, literally, of what it's all about, this is her first book called Parwana, Recipes and Stories from an Afghan Kitchen. It was published in 2020, two years ago now, reflecting on the relationship between food and the faith, history, culture and rolling identities of her country. The book has been published in three languages across continents, winning the 2021 Art of Eating Book Prize and shortlisted as a finalist for the Andre Simon Award. As I mentioned, Dirkani is an Atlantic Fellow for Social Equity in Adelaide. Dirkani. Thanks so much, Fianuala, and thank you to the Atlantic Institute for inviting me to be part of this program. I'm so excited to be here. I'm speaking to you from the land of the Ghana people here in Adelaide, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'll jump straight into reading an excerpt from my book. In April 2012, with family alongside, I returned to Afghanistan for the first time. We crossed the border on foot from Pakistan into Afghanistan at the Khyber Pass. We were retracing our footsteps in the opposite direction to that taken 27 years earlier, when as children, our parents had bundled us together and under a cloud of uncertainty and blind hope, negotiated our way out of Afghanistan and into our future. We were returning as adults, pulled forward by an allure we were yet to understand, perhaps simply by a need to know more. The most striking thing about Afghanistan was its epic landscape, lush and fertile on our arrival in spring. The giant silhouettes of the snow-capped mountains of the Hindu Kush and the cascading layers of crumpled and velvety peaks that lay staggered beneath them inspired an overwhelming reverence, extracting an almost involuntary relinquishment of ego. The peaks played with light and shadow throughout the day, creating a natural rolling spectacle from daybreak to dark, always with an ethereal luminosity. At the base of the peaks, rolling valleys of bright green grass and crops stretched out like gently rolling oceans. It was a landscape with its own distinct energy that easily contextualised the vulnerability of being human and which had watched history unfurl. One of the most immediate and unexpected aspects of Afghanistan that lingers as an enduring memory was the invitation it extended to me. It wrapped me in a warm embrace as if it had been permanently imprinted with the memory of seeing me come into the world. Many things seem strangely familiar from the worn but kind features of its people, to their social mannerisms, to the sweet smell of the spring air. But if for us as voyagers into the nation, there was room to feel enthralled by the experience of reconnecting with our ancestral lands, there was also a deep awareness of the difficulties of life in a region which for almost four decades had been assaulted by the ploys for control of various regimes. All had presented themselves with different ideologies, sometimes worlds apart, but with those differences always somehow denominating to the same acts of depravity and authoritarianism. Time and again, it would prove that the most important thing about each party vying for control was not the content of their ideology, but that they had dogmatically subscribed to an ideology in the first place, one which they were arrogantly intent on imposing upon Afghan people. I left Afghanistan with more of myself falling into place. I had connected more dots about myself, my parents, my ancestors the land I had been born on, and the paradoxes which defined it, all of which refused to be squeezed into the simple binaries and narratives of disconnection that dominated the world I was living in. Thanks. Thank you, Jokani. I'd like to go now to Atlantic Fellows for Social and Economic Equity, Priyanka Khatamaraju and Apu Esther Suresh. They are co-authors of a book which is published towards the end of last year in October called The Murderer, The Monarch and The Fakir, which offers a fresh account of one of the most controversial political assassinations in contemporary history, that of Mahatma Gandhi. It relies largely on investigative journalism as well as new evidence. 
Both fellows examined the potential role of princely states, hypermasculinity, and a militant right wing in the context of a nation that had just won its independence. So please, if you wouldn't mind, we look forward now to hearing an excerpt. Thanks, Pinula, and thank you, everybody, and hello. On behalf of Apu and me, I'm going to read a short excerpt, which is also a journey into the past. In fact, this entire book is a journey into the past with a need to know more. So I will begin. 4th February, 1948, 2.30 p.m. A tall middle-aged cop wearing a khaki turban and sporting a beard that looked like it had been painted on, was returning from the Saftarjung Aerodrome, the only airport in Delhi at the time. Deputy Superintendent of Police, Sardar Jaswant Singh, had just come back after dropping off a prized catch to the Bombay police. The transfer was of Madanlal Pawa, a refugee from Montgomery in Pakistan, who had, on 20th January 1948, set off a gun cotton slab in an attempt to kill Mahatma Gandhi. DSP Singh's ambassador car pulled over at the Tughlaq Road police station. He was tired. He hadn't slept in some days. Singh had spent 20 years in the police, most of them in Punjab. In 1945, he was transferred to Delhi as deputy superintendent of the Parliament Street area. The Parliament, the heart of a newly independent India's power in 1948, was a stone's throw away. Until four days ago, he thought he had seen it all. The imperialism of the British Raj, the rise and spread of the Indian freedom struggle, two world wars and India's tryst with destiny, bloodied by a violent partition. By now, Delhi had turned into a refugee capital. Truckloads of Sikhs and Hindus were arriving from Pakistan in what was one of the world's largest and most violent migrations in history. In 1947, Delhi was a city of almost one million people. More than three lakh Muslims left the city for Pakistan. At the same time, nearly five lakh non-Muslim refugees arrived into the capital from West Punjab, Sindh and the Northwest Frontier Province. Sixteen refugee camps came up in Delhi. The biggest was the one in front of Jama Masjid in North Delhi, as well as others in Nizamuddin, Okhla and near Purana Kila and Humayun's tomb in Central Delhi. Refugees sought shelter everywhere, camps, mosques, temples, gurudwaras, schools, even graveyards. People poured into Delhi carrying stories of unprecedented horror, of loved ones maimed, raped, butchered, of lifetimes of financial savings, assets, memories and lives left cruelly behind. For a newly independent India, a crisis of this magnitude and violence was baptism by fire. The city was a tinderbox and people's emotions were running high. The refugees were hungry, angry, cold and distrustful. The air was thick with fear, insecurity and plots of revenge. As waves of partition violence washed over Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs, on 13th January 1948, a tired old fakir embarked upon his last satyagraha vowing to end it only when peace has returned to Delhi, when a Muslim can walk around in the city all by himself. Mahatma Gandhi asked non-Muslim refugees not to occupy mosques or settle in Muslim neighborhoods by force. He told every Hindu and Sikh not to touch a single Muslim, and he wanted the Indian government to release the balance of payments due to Pakistan, which amounted to 55 crore rupees. At the time, there were many Hindu and Sikh refugees who wished Gandhi dead. Slogans like Gandhi ko marne do, hum ko ghar do rang out in the streets of Delhi. On 20th January 1948, Madanlal Pawa attempted to kill Gandhi and failed. Barely 10 days later, on 30th January, Nathuram Godse fired three bullets that pierced the Mahatma's frail body. Newly independent India, still bleeding, wept and mourned. DSP Jaswan Singh was put in charge of investigating Gandhi's murder. Thank you very much, Priyanka. If we could start with a quick question for you. What is the controversy, apart from obviously the murder of Mahatma Gandhi, why is it so controversial? The murder of Mahatma Gandhi happened with someone who confessed to the crime immediately. So they caught the murderer at the scene of the crime. But what happened in the trial that followed was the biggest intelligence lapse in the history of modern India. This is 
probably the biggest political the assassination in the history of modern Sardar India Sardar. that has been given a desultory mention in our history textbooks. We know nothing about Mahatma Gandhi's murder, the motivations behind it, and the people behind it. We just assume that there was a fanatic Hindu killer who was present on that day, fired three bullets and killed Mahatma Gandhi. We know nothing about the motivations and we do not know enough about the extraordinary cast of characters that was there that planned the murder from almost before independence, August 1947 onwards. And this is something that is new that we brought to light. Most of the trial and independent inquiries into the murder investigation dated from the December, January 1948 period and do not probe any further. So this is the first time that we've actually placed on historical record that the conspiracy went beyond the time frame that has been usually looked at. This is a question for both of you. Presumably inquiring minds would be interested in the background to this assassination. When did you first become aware that this was a lapse or that not enough was known? And is this what gave you the idea for the book? Apu, do you want to feel that question? Sure. The trace of the story is dating back to 2012. Well, I was a journalist. I accidentally, in one of the conversations with one of my sources, whose family has been in civil service for the last three generations. So he mentioned his father was in the intelligence service. And you know what? That gun that killed Gandhi came from a particular prince. And I said, oh, really? So just went back to like first reliance, Google, and he showed something else. So that gave, uh, okay, there's something more than what is seen. And the entire Gandhi files was classified, which also was pretty curious because you normally declassify files after 30 years. But this one particular set of files was classified all throughout. There was already one commission in between. Gandhi was assassinated in 1948, but then a commission of inquiry under a retired judge was set up in 1966, which went on till 69. Yet the documents were classified. So that was a journalistic kick. Okay, if you land on those files, it's a scoop. It's a front page. So the chase was about the papers and not so much of the story. Then towards the end of 2017, just around the time that we were doing Atlantic Fellowship, that both me and Priyanka teamed up and said, okay, now there is a lot that we can do with this and there's much bigger scope. We've been working on this as a book from 2013 onwards because one clearly knew this was much beyond the front page story. So we started collecting documents as much as possible. This is a perfect example because what happened to Gandhi is an apostle of nonviolence, and that was the beginning of India's independence and India as a country is changing. So there's a lot of debate around the world and particularly in India about masculine response to problem, a polarization and othering vis-a-vis the Gandhian way of reconciliation. So we thought this could be a great story, this particular episode, to kind of capture the politics that culminated from Gandhian politics from 1910 to 1948, which is two warring ideologies of nonviolence versus a violent response and an evolution from 1948 to where we are. And you can tell an entire story. So it is using this particular murder mystery to explain 100 years of politics. We also thought this is significant to the world at large because what we're seeing is othering and this hyper-masculine response to the smallest of problems. So you see in US, you see in everywhere. What are we seeing in Ukraine, for instance? It's two cults fighting for their, I would even go to the extent of saying, may legal. So we wanted to capture all of it. And this had the potential to tell that larger story and what happened, what's going on, and what could happen. So how is it relevant today? And also kind of reintroducing the Gandhian concept of peace and reconciliation. And Priyanka, I can ask you, nine years this book was in the making, or if you started in 2013, it was essentially eight years before it was published. Can you talk us through the nuts and bolts of trying to find hard research that's going to make up a significant body of work of the book? I think initially, whatever was publicly available is something that we mined. And Appu's research started from 2013. Mine only began in 2017. So I think he has been at it for a much longer time. But the available public sources of documents were at the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library and the National Archives of India. What was not available were intelligence files for police records, case diaries. I think these are things that only a journalist who has access to these places could have mined them. And to put them all together, I think the Gandhi murder trial files alone are more than 10,000 documents. So we looked at a lot of documents about 
the Hindu Mahasabha, Hindu Mahasabha Papers, which is the right-wing organization that we talk about that was at the center of Mahatma Gandhi's assassination from the National Archives of India and NMML Papers and the trial papers. Apart from looking at intelligence and police documents and case note diaries, I think they were the ones that pieced missing links together for us to understand how investigators approached this. And that showed how much evidence was available, yet the trial did not go and convict the people it should have. And this against the backdrop of an India that had just seen this great leader assassinated, a world leader assassinated. What kind of India did Mahatma Gandhi leave behind at the time of his assassination? And how did it change in the years afterwards? And was that impacted by the trial and the lack of information that seemed to be publicly available? So by 1948, just around the time that Gandhi was assassinated, there was a huge debate. Nobody ever thought in 1914 when Gandhi embarked on this way of nonviolence that it can be successful. So India was fighting an imperial colonial force. And also around the time, there's a lot of armed rebellion across the world. There was a lot of motivations, but Gandhi was very successful in steering the Indian national movement towards a non-violent one, and one I would call an ethical response to oppression. It was not just an attempt to give India independence from a colonial force. It was also an idea to go beyond and give actual freedom. So if you actually look at Gandhian strategy, you will see a lot of similarity of that to capability thesis by Amartya Sen, for instance. If you look at the Human Development Index, all the capabilities per se you would see the traces of that rooting back to the Gandhian politics. But however, just around the time when freedom was on a table, there was partition between two countries based on religious lines and the country's boundaries were redrawn. There was a lot of massive violence. So the Gandhian politics took a backseat at that time, at least in the mainstream. And what Gandhi did in those days is remarkable. Nobody really talk about it today. One of the mass, I mean, you can look it up called Navakali Massacre. That went for months and over, I think, a million people were killed in a massive riot in today's Bangladesh and Calcutta. Yet, Gandhi went there and in three months, he turned the entire place. He made the rioters from both sides put their arms down. So that was nothing short of a miracle. There was many Gandhi, and that's something that we investigated. in. But there's only one Gandhi, which everyone knows at the core, that he was a committed apostle of nonviolence. For him, nonviolence meant everything else. So he was against the concept of a state per se, because he thinks state was a form of violence. You could call it legitimate violence, but it is a form of violence. So the state that Gandhi wanted to leave behind was an ethical state. Now, the religion that Gandhi was trying to interpret, that is Hinduism, was sort of an ethical religion. What we really miss with the assassination of Gandhi, he was old. He was born in 1869. So he was definitely old when he died. But I think with his lifestyle and how he was living, he would have probably lived for another 10 years. And I think that would have made a lot of difference, not just for India, for the entire world on two counts. Number one, when he started practicing nonviolence as a way of protest, nobody believed it was possible. But in 30 years, it happened. There's a lot of debate. People say, oh, it is the Second World War, which led to the freedom of India, not really the Gandhian tradition. Debatable. But even the worst critic of Gandhi would say there was a significant role played by nonviolence. But then what we also saw post that, that the Gandhian nonviolence have secured freedom and liberty in many parts of the world with many shortcomings, but still. So nonviolence as a political tool was invented by Gandhi in many ways. Similarly, the ethical state that Gandhi understands, and he had the moral authority, and that was the most thing. People believed in him. And he, more than anything else, was committed to pursuing an idea. The way that Gandhi worked was through persuasion. I tell you about this. This is the way to do it. You don't agree today, but I will keep talking to you until you change. So he had that persuasion capacity. I wanted to recite that in the book as well. One of the disciples of Gandhi is a man by name Vinod Bhavavi. There was a movement that he led in absence of Gandhi in the 1950s, where he got the feudals to donate land. And he actually aggregated, one disciple of Gandhi could actually aggregate 33,000 hectares of land, which is equal to the size of state of Goa in India, and contributed that to the landless. So the Gandhian methodology or the Gandhian political strategy really worked, and it has relevance. So today we don't know what an ethical state looked like. However, what he left behind was morality in politics. So for the time, the Gandhian ideas remained, or the people who are familiar with the Gandhian politics, I'm talking about the political leadership from 1947 that India got independence, who lasted till say around the 80s, morality mattered. People would resign taking more responsibility if there's a train accident, which is something unthinkable today. Has it changed so much today? Oh, it's completely changed. So morality in politics in India was something that Gandhi introduced. 
while we couldn't really see what an ethical state would look like, which a non-violent state would look like, it just didn't mean that they will not use violence at any point of time. People would say that the Gandhian politics is contradictory at times, but that is only because you're trying to take an episode and trying to analyze it. To understand Gandhi, you really need to go through a whole set of his writing. And Gandhi himself has said, if there are two different versions of the same argument I make, consider the last argument as my argument, because truth is like infinity. What was true yesterday was not true today because he was in pursuit of truth. He was one person who pursued truth all throughout. A critique that I hear very often is the Gandhi's views on racism or gender in the early part of his life, which if you look at the writings towards the later part of his life, it completely changed. But then we would look at that and say, oh, Gandhi was a racist. So it evolved. And we tried to understand where he come from and where he landed on. So there's a different debate. Another big loss that the world has, by 1947 onwards, after getting political freedom from a colonial rule, Gandhi was training his eyes on transforming the society. He was moving ahead with the concept of trusteeship, which we today talk about, which is philanthropy. The Gandhian concept is in two lines is that you make money, but you believe that you're a custodian of others' money because he understood human psychology far better. So he said, if he tells people to stop making money, nobody's going to do that. So the way that he was transforming it was that you do make money, but you're just a trustee. So you're making money on behalf of people and you have to spend it on the people's welfare program. So at a time where the world was competing between three ideologies, I would say two dominant ideologies and offshoot of one ideology, that is capitalism versus communism, and in between socialism, Gandhi would have introduced what is a fourth economic paradigm, one that talked about sustainable economy. So Gandhi got his due as a political thinker, but I think where he hasn't got his due is as an original economic thinker. That, I think, is the biggest loss to the world and India in particular. That is fascinating. And I wonder, in writing this book, I'll put this question to Priyanka, in the research for this book, did you come across any obstacles in terms of the research? Did you find anything that completely surprised you as you were on your journey towards the publication of this book? I think the amount of information, we've called it the biggest intelligence lapse in the history of modern India for a reason, because there was so much information available, which was not brought to the trial, which was not even brought to light in the Jeevan Lal Kapoor Commission inquiry, which happened in the 60s. So I think a lot of the information was new, fresh, and something that was very surprising how the police and intelligence agencies, even at the time, this is pre-independent India, were able to track movements of different organizations and different social groups in the freedom movement or involved in making politics at that time. It was hard in the sense COVID was a big obstacle because we could not access a lot of archives because of COVID. But other than that, to get the information and to arrange it in whether a chronological order or an order that made sense was a huge task. Because a lot of these files relating to Mahatma Gandhi's assassination, as well as politics around at that time, is so haphazardly arranged by the state and in archives that I think the biggest challenge was to go through it and make sense of it, make some sense of it. We've only scratched the surface. This is just the tip of the iceberg of the mountain of information that we came across. There was a lot of information even on the partition violence that happened. I think something that is surprising is the story of Madan Lal Pawa, the person who failed in the attempt to assassinate Gandhi 10 days before the successful assassination attempt. Madan Lal Pawa's story was something that was very surprising and what we found out in terms of what he said in the trial as well. He was a refugee from Pakistan who came into India, who faced a lot of violence and whose journey as a refugee in India is something that is relatively unknown. At that time, Hindu and Sikh refugees and Muslim refugees had real grouse against leaders who were representing them. So Madan Lal Pawa had legitimate reasons, according to us, to want Gandhi's death and how he became a pawn, a foot soldier of carrying out a right-wing conspiracy. I think these were some of the biggest challenges that we had to arrange documents, to parse through them and to make sense of them. Disparate documents from small police stations and intelligence agencies from official towns. I think that was one of our biggest challenges in collecting the data. And putting the jigsaw together. We heard earlier from Dakani, who is, of course, an Atlantic Colors of Social Equity. She's in Adelaide. Dakani, Priyanka and Apu had a really fact-driven 
almost research journey in terms of writing this book. And I'm sure that they had many emotions in terms of discoveries and how they felt. But your excerpt that you just read is really a very personal journey about trying to connect the dots for yourself. I wonder Mm. if you could maybe just give us a little sense of your backstory about coming to Australia and what that sense of displacement might have been like and how that contributed to the germination of the idea for your book. Yeah, I think just on the question of research and how I came about sources for what would be the foundations of what I wanted to write, I wanted to make sure that the way I conveyed the narrative was in the form of story and a personal lens could be placed over that story to give the story of being an Afghan person, a refugee, a migrant, an Afghan woman, to give that story some depth and some context outside of the very narrowed confines of the way being Afghan is understood in dominant narratives today. What do you think is the biggest misconception that people have around Afghanistan and Afghan people? Well, so much about this book is a reclamation for me personally, because I think that nearly everything about Afghanistan in terms of the way the world understands it and where it has been positioned is through a lens of imperialism and through the lens of whiteness. Afghan people are seen in a frame that is so sanitised and one-dimensional because everything about us is couched in language that is masculine. When Apu was saying that, my ears pricked because so much about Afghan identity has been reduced to this macho, militaristic, national security kind of language. And a really important part of what I wanted to do for myself personally was to retrieve language of my own ancestors, language that is completely different, that if understood, if, you know, those words and those histories that are told by us instead of pasted over the top of us by dominating forces. If those words could be surfaced, then I knew I could tell a story through the lens of cuisine and what cuisine means for displaced people and exploring all the different strands. But definitely the key theme that ran through it all for me was something that I've really personally experienced, which is this need, this absolute drive to find myself and my my story as an Afghan person from everything about us that has been carved out, which is our culture, our ancestry, the beautiful cross-pollination that is part of our cultural identity and our cultural story, the humanist traditions that form part of what it is to be an Afghan person, the really very contemporary identity that Afghanistan has had throughout history, which has been reduced to this ossified notion of tribalism and masculinity and machoism. And so for me, it was really important to say, well, the way I perceive myself as an Afghan person, and indeed this is so consistent for so many Afghan people all over the world, the way we perceive ourselves with all that multidimensionality and the complexity and the beauty of our own history and our own stories is a far cry from the way the world has been conditioned into perceiving us because of decades of imperially driven violence. So for me, the process of putting together this cookbook with my family, with my mother, my sisters, was really in a very big part about what knowledge counts, whose words would inform my story, and a very important why for me in writing this book was breaking those knowledge power cycles that are driven to elevate only the voices of the dominant while drowning out and erasing further the voices of the marginalised. So it was a very personal journey, but that notion of the personal was informed by a lot of reading and a lot of challenging what sources count and really trying to retrieve primary sources, Afghan people's voices, so that we could piece together and tell and share our story through our own eyes and not through the eyes of the dominators. And how much of that thinking had evolved before you actually began the book? Were there any surprises and did you learn anything? Did you change direction as so often happens when someone undertakes a project such as this? 
Yes, absolutely. I think for me personally, the way I approached the entire endeavor was not to feel I had to produce a certain story or a certain outcome. I was just very open to the uncertainty and I wanted to be as true and as honest as possible to the sources and where those voices and stories led me. And so it wasn't this kind of pre-meditated idea of what I had to produce. I just wanted to open up and dig and excavate deep into my own personal story and to reclaim the erasures and to find my own voice in the process. And so for me, it was really a personally transformative process because I came across so many of Afghanistan's own intellectual histories. And, you know, the whole world has been conditioned into thinking we have no intellectual histories. And that's why it's fine to constantly wage war against us and to call us a graveyard of empires and essentially a kind of a wasteland. So for me, it was really important to find those sources. And I'm really lucky in the sense that adds another layer of the personal for me. Some of the writing I could find was from people that were related to me. So my mum's first cousin, who was a philosopher and a thinker and a journalist, he was one of the only people that the whole world came to for sources during the height of the Cold War in the 70s and 80s, because he didn't subscribe to any of the propaganda that was happening all over the world around that war at the time when the US and Soviet Russia were kind of playing out these tensions on Afghan soil, a lot like what's happening in Ukraine today. So if I could find these sources written by my own family, I still remember reading this simple survey he conducted of all the refugees. The biggest exiled population in the world was the Afghan people in the 80s, and we still hold that terrible position in the world. He did this really simple survey asking the refugees in all the camps in Pakistan, what do you want? They didn't want the communists leading Afghanistan. Afghanistan, they didn't want the Islamist extremists leading Afghanistan, which was just this very foreign thing for traditional Afghan cultural identity. They wanted their own leaders. It was a third way. And so for all of the work that he did, he posed quite a threat to the established order, which needed chaos <laughs> to reign. And he lost his life for his work, for his insistence on Afghan people being self-actualized and being the claimers of their own future. To read all his papers and his documents and one of the questions that he posed right at the end of this amazing paper was we don't blame Afghan people for trying to save their families and having to leave Afghanistan at the height of all this violence and war but when you have a chance will you come back and help the pursuit of freedom in Afghanistan so reading things like that totally transformed me and gave me a sense of drive and purpose and a real understanding of how important it is to base my work and my ideas on these kind of neglect erased sources so that my voice felt like it was coming from something that meant something to me and meant something to the future of Afghanistan and its people. Just a final question to you. As you talk about your uncle and this being such a personal journey for you, in that reclamation that you spoke about, do you feel that you closed a circle for yourself at all? And have you thought about how you might further explore that narrative Yeah, absolutely. I suppose I would call it a loop, but what it's triggered for me is an infinite loop. I just feel like you can take those circles deeper and deeper, these concentric circles, until your own understanding keeps evolving. Like what Apu mentioned about the truth of yesterday won't be my truth of tomorrow because I'll unearth more, I'll excavate more, I'll have new understandings, new things will emerge for what I want to write about. Writing this book for me and exploring my identity through the lens of cuisine and all of Afghanistan's neglected stories and voices, it really just ignited for me a path forward, which is for me personally about reclaiming the feminine, the lost feminine of Afghanistan and creating a language that enables us to dream, creating a language that allows Afghan people a future because right now all the language about us is deadening. And so I'm so passionate about that. And for me, what's happened is I feel like I've just scratched the surface with this first book and there are so many other things it created for me. And I'm definitely in the process of putting all those other ideas together. You know, how can an Afghan worldview, everything about us that's been carved out, How and why does that matter for the world today? Because there are so many things about being Afghan, taking the long lens of history through to the today, through to what's going to be present in the future, that really matters. And I feel for me personally, that's what my tomorrows will be. 
It's just wonderful to hear you talk like this and the passion, obviously, with which you've approached this whole narrative and to hear that you see it as a loop and that you want to continue exploring it because I can only imagine the depths to which you will go in doing that and what you'll be able to share with the world about your country and your people. For the moment, I would just like to leave it there with you, Jokani. We're joined now by two fellows, Adekemi Adenayan and Eliza Squibb. Adekemi is an Atlantic Fellow for Health Equity, US and Global. She's a dentist, a public health officer, a mentor and founder of Dental Care Foundation. This is an organization that is really working towards creating a change in the oral health system in Africa. Her book is called The Girl Who Found Her Smile, and it's an educational oral health storybook. Now, the book's editor, who she collaborated with, is also an Atlantic Fellow for Health Equity, US and Global, Eliza Squibb. You're currently both exploring how to distribute this book. But first of all, thank you for being able to join us. And if I could ask one or both of you to share an excerpt of your book for us, please. The Girl Who Found Us Now. My name is Anita. I like crunching candies with my teeth. Candies are so sweet and yummy. When I finish one, I ask my mom for more. My mom says candies are not good for my young teeth. She wants me to eat more fruits than candy. Mom tells me to brush my teeth twice daily, every morning when I wake up and every night before I go to bed. Brushing doesn't hurt, but I hate it. I stay in the bathroom for a while, then I get out without brushing. Mom doesn't even know. This morning, I'm so excited. We are going to take a school photo. My school uniform is very clean and I'm going to stand up tall. I'll show my most beautiful smile to make the photo happy. Oh no, what happened to my tooth? It hurts and my canine is all green. This is not good for the school photo. I don't think I can smile. Students, three, two, one, smile. Everyone open your eyes wide and give your biggest smile. Click. But the teacher doesn't like the smile. Not everyone was given the biggest smile. In fact, I can't smile at all. Let's do it again. Anita, this time, I want you to smile. Ready? Three, two, one, smile. I'm sorry, teacher. I can't smile. And that is where we'll leave you in a little bit of suspense. (laughs) A cliffhanger. Tell me, whose idea was this? Did you both come up with the idea together? How did it originate? And then maybe we can talk through the mechanics of getting the beautiful illustrations into publication. The good thing about the Atlantic Fellows program is that you meet people and ideas are sparked in the room. And this idea was all started when we had a convening in Washington. Eliza works in art and health, so we just got talking. We kind of brainstormed about how art was important in propagating health messages and education. And we we're like, oh, we could probably just do a book or a comic thing for children. And it all started in the room that day. We took the conversation further and kept messaging back and forth until this came to fruition. Talk us through how you went about the process of, for example, getting the book published, bringing it all together. I'll just allow Eliza to talk on that. I'm a textile designer. I use textile design as a storytelling tool for health as well. So that was definitely how these conversations started. In my work, it's very important to always connect with local artists who understand the cultural context. We found this amazing artist in Rwanda. His name is Dolph Banza. He's so passionate about health projects. He really takes on anything related to health. So he was able to beautifully illustrate the story that Kimmy wrote. And we're still very much in the process of figuring out the self-publishing world. We've met a couple of barriers in that. And in fact, we'd love to hear any advice or guidance that other successes people have had because we're still in the learning process in terms of bringing all that together. I can see, obviously, why if you're working in the dental profession, that you would be interested in young girls taking care of their teeth and oral health children generally. What are those obstacles, if I may ask generally? What was the intention of the book? Is it a book you'd like to see in many countries across Africa? Do you have international hopes for it beyond the continent? Yeah, the good thing is that we also have the book translated into three Nigerian languages and French. And in fact, Eliza did the French translation. The aim is to get the book to every child across the world 
So it doesn't matter whether you're on the African continent, Australia, it doesn't matter. The aim is to get them children excited about their mouths, talking about their mouths just by reading a storybook. Because we know how far storybooks can go when it comes to children and educating them. We also plan to get this book across to rural children for free. And one of the things that we were trying to do is to build sustainability, get this book sold online in different countries to people that can afford it. While the money or the proceeds is used to print other books to children who can afford to get it. So in fact, the aim is to get the book global. During the process, it has showed us a lot of inequities that happen in book publishing. One of the barriers that we met is trying to actually find a platform that could probably get the book digitally or print on demand to some of those developed countries. I couldn't get it registered because the organization is located in Nigeria. So it was back and forth trying to find a print on demand service online that could fit for the continent yet serve globally. So that's why we've been going back and forth. And maybe Eliza could touch on that. You're acting as a distributor. You're trying to find a means to distribute this book equitably. So some things have been incredibly positive. Getting the COVID solidarity funding from Atlantic Fellows allowed Kemi to turn the story into an animation because we were already working with such a talented illustrator who has a team who works with him. He was able to transform it. So now we have that story in two different media. That helps a lot for distribution. Another aspect of how the book fits into Kemi's work is that after the story, Mm -hmm. there's a whole set of these pledge pages. So it really engages children in oral health and taking care of their oral health, some really actionable things to do. That's a whole aspect of how the book would roll out as part of Penny's dental program for rural kids. What kind of expertise are you looking for? It seems as though you're looking for legal advice in various countries about how you can broach the obstacles there, but perhaps there's more. We've looked at a lot of on-demand printing and self-publishing They serve a U.S. audience and and maybe Europe as well. So that's been one of the challenges. And then just understanding more about the publishing world in general. We're complete newbies when it comes to that. So that's a little bit of a hurdle as well. I think it's so fantastic what you've done. What were your expectations before you published it? Obviously to go global, but has there anything that has surprised you along the way or that you've learned about yourself with this whole new skill set in some ways that you've developed? Well, surprises. I think we had a lot of back and forth because we're new to this. I think along the way, we had questions of, oh, should we have children put together to talk about the book? Should we have done this? Should we have done some more focus groups? So I think we were learning in the journey. So for me, I think everything was more of a surprise because we had to go through a lot of new things together, I guess. One more question about the process of writing this book. How do you take a subject like oral health? This is the question you're probably asking yourselves. How do you take a question of oral health and try to influence children alone that this is something that will work? How do you measure success on that front? How have you been able to measure how well the book has been going down? One of the things we're trying to do, and it has worked in the state I am in Nigeria, is get this book to children in schools and get this book approved as an oral health educational book in schools. I'm going to use the story of my young brother because I say this all the time. It's part of the story because when he was three, he didn't like to brush at all. He was always screaming and shouting. So when we developed this book, I started reading the book to him. And I realized that just two weeks after, he would often come to me and say, hey, I want to be like Anita. I want to brush my teeth. It's so funny now because he wants to brush five times a day. I'm like, no, it doesn't work that way. And the animation video also, the song, you just see how it affects children. Because one thing about storybook is for me, I can remember the storybooks I read when I was very, very little. I read books as an adult and sometimes some of them don't stay with me, but I can remember almost every book I read. It's very, very strong in passing educational messages. So one of the things that we are currently doing and working on as a survey is to, after giving these books to children in school, just to measure how it has affected them by having these conversations, having these interviews, and seeing if this has sparked conversations in their homes, among their peers. So far, it's been a success, especially with the videos. 
And we really hope that it's more of a success, not just in Africa, not just in Nigeria, but everywhere else. And presumably you can take any research that you have or evidence of impact to potential distributors or publishers. Yeah. Eliza, were you going to say something? There's a song as well. Yeah. <laughs> There's a song about brushing your teeth, which reminds children of the steps. And then also it's a certain length of time that they brush for. So it flows through a lot of different media in that way. Oh, well, it's wonderful that you've been able to join us. And just on the whole question of publishing, I wanted to go back to Afu and Priyanka in relation to their book about the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi and new evidence that they uncovered. What was the publication journey like for you once you had the book largely written? And what was that process like? It's not an easy journey in the Indian publishing industry at all. I've recently learned that people have literary agents now to pitch your books. And that's not how I was seeing the publishing journey at all. I remember about 10, 15 years ago, handwriting chapters or proposal ideas and sending them off, mailing them to publishers and waiting for about six months to hear from them whether they were going to accept the pitch or pass on it. But being journalists, I think, has given us a definite foothold because publishers are always looking for ideas, looking for things that are in the news or could make news. That was one thing that worked in our favor. But if you recently seen in India, Amazon took over were an Indian publishing house and then shut it down after publishing a host of very critical and important non-fiction works because it was unsustainable. Financially unsustainable? or uh, yeah, Financially unsustainable and also I think politically unsustainable. That is something that has come to light because all the authors, they were mostly first-time authors, a lot of them were journalists and a lot of them were talking about things that exposed the state and its very many failures or sides of the state held them accountable. So I think that was one thing that we were also afraid of. Because HarperCollins is a publishing giant, they were able to take on a book that was as risky as this. So your fears weren't materialized? I wouldn't say they were not materialized because there is a lot of self-censorship as well. The book is not promoted as much as other books because it is a controversial book. There are places where we would not wade into controversy or we would just take a step back and not do that. I think publishers have to be very careful or they are very careful because legally this could be a nightmare. But they've been brave enough to publish the book. I think that is something in favor for the Indian publishing industry that is still happening. But there is a certain amount of self-censorship that goes with it. I wonder if I could put a similar question to Dakani in terms of her publishing journey. I mean, presumably it didn't entail the same risks. My publishing journey was probably a bit of a dream-like one. (laughs) I was really lucky in that the publishers approached me and us and asked if we wanted to put the recipes and stories into a narrative and recipe book. That was off the back of a physical presence, which was our family's restaurants and the way that had created and had an anchorage in our community. They still took a very big leap of faith because I've written lots of different things, but never in long form and never a recipe book. So I think there's a few things like if and when you do have a publisher, a relationship that is based on trust is so important because I wasn't writing a conventional recipe book and it went into the politics of things. It went into questions of identity. It went into questions around imperialism and (laughs) skewed narratives and all of that kind of thing. And they allowed me the freedom and the trust to do that with no kind of changing of my story and minimal editing. So I was really lucky in that I had really great relationships with my publishers and editors. They aren't relationships that just happen. It's so hard to stick to writing deadlines because I was writing in amongst still working and still doing a lot of things for the Atlantic Fellowship as well, which actually added to the depth and dimensionality of my voice, which is so lucky. (laughs) Just meeting all different fellows and being part of these parallel stories that just kept feeding into everything I was thinking about and processing. So they gave me that space to write in that way. But 
it has to be a relationship of reciprocity. I met my deadlines. I was really open to feedback. I wasn't afraid if they wanted to put things in a different order or had better suggestions about what I thought about. There was no being precious, basically, which was a really great way to do it. There's definitely a lot that publishers have to think about that we as authors don't really think about. We just want to get our story out there and we have a belief and a passion for what it is we're trying to convey. So I guess maybe something useful is to really think about their perspective in terms of of what they need to make a book hit bookstores and do well. Because if you're not self-publishing and a publisher takes on your book, they really are running a lot of calculations around what they can sell and how much they can kind of recoup of the publishing costs, all of which they take on for you. So it was all a crash course for me. The first time I dealt with a big publisher, but luckily that was a relationship that became quite strong and based on trust. Thank you so much, Dokani, for that. I'd like to bring in Eliza and Adekemi for a final word about their publication journey. You talked about trust, Dokani. Presumably, there has been the support of the fellowship also, or fellows that you met in your conversations. Would it be too much to presume, Eliza and Adekemi, that the trust between both of you in terms of getting this book to where it is now has really helped forge a mission, a collective mission, to continue to get the book to where you feel it needs to be? Let me just start and say it's been amazing and the trust I feel has even made me more vulnerable to be able to share the challenges with her. And she's always given, this is the way, probably better like this, easier to take in those corrections and say that, oh, it could probably be better. So I feel that the trust has made it work and it's just going to get better from my hand also. So it's amazing. That's wonderful, Eliza. As someone who's trained as an artist, as a visual person, it's great to be able to bring my perspective to this health equity work. It's a wonderful way to use those skills to think about visuals, how it could work, how it could impact people, and it feels good. Well, thank you for sharing your story. I'd like to thank also Dakani, of course, and Aku and Priyanka for sharing their insights from the art of publishing and the art of research and writing, but also the focus of equity in terms of Mahatma Gandhi and the kind of man that he was, the politician he was, and of course, Dokani in a never-ending quest to really try and reclaim the identity of Afghans for themselves. Thank you again, everybody.